Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and go through a few examples of graphing some of the harder rationals that you could potentially come across out there. And so problem number 22 here in our notes, t of x equals x squared minus 4 over x squared minus 1. Uh, be careful that you do not make the mistake of trying to cancel out terms. That's not something that really works. It's not true. What we have to do with these two things is recognize that they are quadratics. Uh, they're actually difference of two squares quadratics. They're pretty, pretty special. And uh, so x times x creates x squared. 2 times 2 creates the second group. And so I can take that and I can split it up into its two factors, x plus 2 times x minus 2. If I foiled that, it would create um, plus 2x and minus 2x in the middle, which cancel the bottom is also a difference of two squares. So we have two perfect quadratics in our numerator and denominator, but it's using x and x and 1 and 1. So that would be x plus 1 and x minus 1. So if you look, nothing cancels out. So something that we can uh, say because of that is that this graph will have no holes. And that's always something to be looking out for. If you have a hole uh, somewhere in your graph, you'll have an open circle. Um, but that's not the case for this particular function. Next, I look at the x-intercepts. And the x-intercepts always come from the numerator. So I'm looking up here to figure that out. And so I will have x-intercepts at x equals negative 2 from our first group. And then x equals positive 2 from our second group. So negative 2 comma 0 and 2 comma 0. Both of those are pretty important locations on this graph. Thirdly, I go ahead and I look at vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes are always restrictions on the domain, meaning they come from when we don't want our denominator to equal 0. So vertical asymptote, we will have those at x equals negative 1 and x equals positive 1. So we can go ahead and we can put those on our picture as well. We'll switch over to make those dashed. So we know that we cannot cross those asymptotes. It kind of divides it up into a left-hand region, a center region that's very skinny, and then a right-hand region. So now we just have to figure out where the rest of the um, features come from. And so the trickiest part, I think, is placing that horizontal asymptote. Okay, the horizontal asymptote really looks at the size of our original problem. And so the degree of the top, if I write that out, is 2. And the degree of the bottom is 2. This is the same size uh, numerator as the denominator same over same. And if I have that ratio, I'm going to equal um, the ratio of the lead coefficients. Okay, so uh, it's 1x squared over 1x squared. Essentially, if you are canceling that out, you are going to get the number 1 out of this. Okay, 1x squared over 1x squared is 1. And so your horizontal asymptote is going to be at y equals that value y equals 1. So I can take y equals 1, I can put it on my graph, and now I know that I don't get closer and closer to the x-axis, I get closer and closer to the height of 1. Our calculator work here in a minute will confirm that as well. Now one other thing that is very important with the horizontal asymptote in this idea is that sometimes, in these cases, it's nice to do long division, okay? So what does long division reveal? And it may seem unnecessary, but there is um, some structure underneath that long division uh, will tell us that we wouldn't be able to see otherwise. And so I think it's a beneficial thing. We're going to go ahead and we're going to set up that long division process. Uh, and you have to go back here to the original question because you can't do long division with groups of things. So I'm dividing by x squared minus 1. 
and then the dividend, the thing inside, is x squared, and we need to fill in 0x, and then it's minus 4. That's the numerator part. So going through that long division process, x squared needs to get multiplied by 1 in order to get x squared, the inside term. So 1 times x squared is x squared, and 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. Notice how I skipped this section of the graph, because a number times a number should line up with a number. Now we can take those groups and subtract them away. x squared minus x squared is 0. That's always good to get. And then negative 4, subtracting a negative 1. So it's like adding 1. You end up getting negative 3. You don't really have to do anything with uh, the x. It's not really affecting anything. 0x and 0x just uh, is still 0x, I suppose. So can we multiply x squared to get negative 3? Well, the answer to that would be no. Negative 3 is our remainder. And we should understand how to write our remainders. We take that number, we put it on the top of a fraction with our specific divisor, x squared minus 1. So if you go ahead and look at this, it's all twisted around, but we have some important information that's hidden in here. Negative 3 over x squared minus 1 is our rational function. And then having a positive 1 at the front, a plus 1, tells me that this has been moved up 1. This is my horizontal asymptote. I also can tell it's been reflected, it's been stretched. All of those ideas kind of come into play once I start to see the, the picture, okay, and where it's going. Well, that's another way to kind of reveal where your horizontal asymptote would be. Those things connect together, and they should always connect together, all three of these different methods. So, since um, we don't really have a lot of extra information otherwise, uh, you know this doesn't tell me how to count or anything like that. It's got an x squared on the bottom. We're going to have to rely on our calculator. So if we pull up our calculator, and we can type in the factored form, or we can type in the original form, it might be a little bit easier here to type in the original, just shorter. So if you go to y equals, under the y equals menu, we can just go ahead and write x squared minus 4, and then divide that by, oops, we'll need a group here to group the denominator all together, x squared, and then minus 1. So you could also do a caret button, so to the second power would also look like this. Um, you don't have to necessarily use the squared key, but it is a little bit shorter. If we hit graph, we can see it's pretty stable, and then it drops off. Then the top part here in the middle uh, seems to be positive, and then we come from below, right next to that asymptote, and then we start to level off again. And both of these two edges approach the horizontal asymptote. So that gives me a little bit of a preview that I'll be down in uh, this yard, then somewhere up here, and then over in that yard again. Okay, it bounces back and forth. But the thing I'm really interested in would be the table of values and getting some of these different values. And this is our work. So we're going to go ahead and let's go past the asymptote. I know negative 2 uh, should give me 0, so I'm seeing that point currently. Negative 3 uh, gives me 0.625. So as a table of x and y values, that would be a pretty good one to write down. Negative 3 and then 0.625. It's a little bit over halfway. So we're already approaching that asymptote. Then if I keep on going, maybe out towards negative uh, 9, negative 10, I, I see that I'm very, very, very close to 1. So negative 9 and then 0 0.96. Specifically 9625. So out here, that's where I'm getting this point that's uh, not quite touching the asymptote. It is also helpful. I might choose uh, negative 1.2 or something just a smidge to the left of the asymptote. That way I can see it dropping down. But in order to do that, I'm going to have to change my settings. So second window, I can change this from automatically generating numbers 
to asking for some of these different numbers, these x values. And so if I do negative 1.2, uh, the answer that goes with that is negative 5.818. So left of the asymptote and down 5 and a smidge. All right, this is kind of the process to get the left-hand curve of our graph. The center part of the curve would probably be beneficial to use 0 as an x value, and if I put 0 in, um, 0 goes with a y value of 4. You could also uh, literally put 0 in and square it and subtract 4. 0 in and square it and subtract 1. Negative 4 over negative 1 is positive 4. That's the uh, easiest way to probably get these numbers using algebra. Just substitute them in. 0 is pretty easy to substitute in. Now from here, I could test some more values, but uh, this graph is going to be approaching the asymptote on either side. It's trapped up here in this very skinny yard. And then the right-hand side, if I go ahead and uh, put in maybe a y value of 3, 0.625, or a y value of 4, 0.8, you get to choose kind of any of those y values that you would like. So I'm going to do 4 and then 0.8. These should support, you need 5 or 6 different values uh, to give your graph some legitimacy. And now we can go ahead and fill out the last couple pieces of information, the domain. The x values for this go left forever and right forever, but we're broken up by two different values. So we could say all reals, and then our restrictions here happen at negative 1 and then positive 1. As an interval, uh, it would look like negative infinity to negative 1, negative 1 to positive 1, and then 1 to positive infinity. So you can see it's literally broken up at the two asymptotes. I don't care which way you do it, you get to choose. Then the range. The range, the y values here go down forever, so negative infinity. But they do not go up forever without encountering a very large gap. And so what I typically do is I account for that gap similar to what I just did here with my three different intervals. The highest part of our lower section happens underneath 1. And 1 itself is an asymptote, so I would put a parenthesis there. I never quite reach a height of 1. I get close, um, like 0.9625 is close, and I get closer, but I never equal 1. Then the other part of this graph picks up at a height of 4, and that just keeps going up and up and up forever. There's a substantial gap in between these. So I would have 4 and then infinity. We know to put parentheses on infinity. Do I put a parenthesis on the 4? That's a pretty good question. And it all depends on whether you can stand at that minimum. And 0 can equal 4. I can have a solid point there. And so I would put a bracket at that value. So that is kind of unusual. We don't have a lot of graphs that have ranges that are tricky like that, but it's good to see an example. As for the end behavior, talk about as x travels to the left, so it, so it goes to negative infinity. The y values here are headed towards 1, and they're headed towards 1 from below. 0 0.96, 0 0.999, things like that. Then as x goes to the right towards infinity, the y values here are traveling towards 1, but again, they're traveling towards 1 from underneath 1, so from below. That would be, again, answers like 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.998. You just keep getting closer and closer and closer to that whole number 1, to that asymptote. And there you go. Hopefully that helps clarify the process to kind of work your way through some of these questions. I always talk about holes, x-intercepts, vertical asymptotes. That's pretty, pretty straightforward. The toughest part is your horizontal asymptote and the work that goes with figuring out what's going on. An xy table, forgot to label the y part of that, is pretty helpful in order to kind of confirm where your graph goes. So that's uh, sometimes needed for these harder questions. Hope that helps, guys, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Take care.